Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the LTI Mindtree Q2 FY25 Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchtone telephone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I will now hand the conference over to Mr. Vikas Jadav, Head of Investor Relations, LTI Mindtree. Thank you. And over to you, sir. Thank you. Good day, everyone, and welcome to LTI Mindtree's Quarter 2 FY25 earnings call. Uh, today on the call, we have with us uh, Mr. Devashish Chatterjee, who is the Chief Executive Officer and uh, the Managing Director, Mr. Sudhir Chaturvedi, President of Global Markets, uh, Mr. Nachiket Deshpande, who is our Chief Operating Officer, and uh, Mr. Vipul Chandra, who is our Chief Financial Officer. So we'll begin uh, with a brief overview of the company's quarter two FI25 performance, after which we'll, you know, uh, we'll open the floor for q and uh, Just want to kind of, you know, remind you that during the call, we could make certain forward-looking statements. These statements consider the environment as we see as of today and carry risk and uncertainty <clears throat> that could cause our actual results to differ materially from the expressed from those expressed today uh, in today's call. We do under uh, we do not undertake to update any forward-looking statement made on this call. Uh, you can find this forward-looking statement in our earnings release also. Uh, with that, now I turn out the call to DC for his opening remarks. Thank you, Vikas. Good evening and good morning to everyone on the call. Thank you for joining us today. I'm happy to report that uh, Q2 was a good quarter marked by broad-based sequential growth we experienced across all our verticals and geos, and several multi-year deal closures in manufacturing, energy and utilities, and BFS verticals. We consolidated our standing in an existing account through vendor consolidation and long-term revenue commitment, securing a US dollar 200 million plus TCV over a five-year period. Our large deal pipeline remains robust, with several deals nearing final decisions. These positive trends are reflected in the strong hiring of over 2,500 employees during this quarter. We also opened 22 new logos during the quarter. With that preamble, let me summarize the numbers. <clears throat> I am pleased to report a sequential growth of 2.8% in U.S. dollar terms against the backdrop of a largely status quo IT spend environment. Q2 revenue stood at U.S. dollars 1.13 billion and was up by 4.4% in constant currency and 4.7% in dollar terms on a year-on-year -year basis. On the margin front, the EBIT margin for the quarter stood at 15.5%, an improvement of 50 basis points sequentially. And the net profit margin was at 13.3%. Q2 order inflow stood at TCV of US dollars 1.3 billion. <clears throat> In a continued challenging macro environment, the need for a substantial shift and pivot towards AI is quite clear to us. To lead in this new AI influenced business environment, we did a complete LTI mindful level pivot to an AI-first approach, which continues to drive our success amid these disruptive times. I will today share with you our AI strategy, which is anchored in three core principles. AI in everything, ensuring we reimagine everything for AI, creating a supportive ecosystem for all AI innovation to scale within the enterprise, and lastly, AI for everyone, democratizing AI for the benefit of all stakeholders. Let me elaborate further on these three components of our AI strategy. First, we will adopt AI ourselves and transform the way we work by infusing AI in everything we do. For example, we are enhancing experiences with the help of Gen AI augmented creatives and content. We are also running and optimizing campaign operations with AI power tools. Our knowledge fabric driven agent and co-pilots based IT operations 
is helping unlock the next level of efficiency and productivity. We are leveraging AI for legacy modernization. For security operations, we are focusing on AI-driven threat detection and response. We are using Vision AI for industry 4.0 use cases like defect detection in metals. We are reimagining platform operations with an AI-first approach in areas such as underwriting, claims processing, and customer service operations. We also recognize the challenges our customers are facing in scaling AI for the enterprise, which could be in the form of trust in data, cost of scaling, AI safety, adoption, or human impact. To address these challenges, we collaborate with our customers to engineer platforms that enable AI at scale. This commitment forms our second principle, everything for AI. It encompasses preparing data foundations and infrastructure for AI, building trust, and observability, and implementing the right controls for generative AI applications. Just to illustrate the scale we have achieved in a short span, the LTI Mindtree AI platform we launched earlier has been adopted in 40 plus customer environments to achieve the same. The third principle of our AI strategy is AI for everyone. And this focuses on empowering people and humanizing AI. We aim to achieve this by firstly developing co-pilots and navigator apps tailored for every persona. Next, creating AI solutions that are human by incorporating the right guardrails, bias management, and trust. And lastly, addressing use cases that leverage AI for the betterment of humanity and contribute to solving global challenges. We are already seeing positive outcomes from this strategy, both in terms of value delivered to our customers and the impact on our generative AI-based deals and pipeline. For example, for our financial services major, we have doubled the first-time resolution percentage for the contact center. Our AI in everything strategy is driving success across our service line offerings and industry verticals, enabling us to win deals by leveraging generative AI capabilities, let me share with you some examples of AI-powered wins for the quarter. A U.S. global manufacturing leader chose LTI Mindtree as a preferred partner for its global application management and transformation services. We used our AI-first next-gen operations framework to enhance efficiency, foster innovation, and speed up transformation. This opportunity arose from vendor consolidation, where we became the sole partner for the customer from four existing vendors. This was the largest multi-year deal for LTI Mindtree. A major global financial institution selected LTI Mindtree to collaborate on modernizing their wealth data platform. We utilized advanced automation technologies along with GNAI to improve customer experience and broaden the customer's global market reach. This was achieved by developing a new data taxonomy, adopting cloud technology for faster service delivery to clients and partners, modernizing mainframes, and reducing operational costs. We have been selected by a leading U.S.-based energy utility company as, a, as its long-term strategic partner for end-to-end -end IT operations in the AI-first model. We have won an infrastructure transformation and managed services deal <clears throat> from an engineering measure on the back of our AI-powered IT operation solution. We are clear about the role of the ecosystem in this pivot. We are consistently launching AI solutions and offerings to our partner ecosystem, which not only amplifies our AI strategy, but also acts as a powerful channel for growth. For instance, LTI Mindtree and IBM have launched the IBM AI Innovation Center at Bangalore's, Bengaluru's Hebel campus. This center will develop top-tier solutions to speed up clients' AI adoption. It will highlight advanced technologies and innovative AI, machine learning, and data science solutions featuring IBM's Watson X. We are empowering our workforce by providing them with generative AI tools and training to our 
edutech platform garuda this platform offers tailored training pathways based on employee skill levels and technology backgrounds featuring curated programs for both our internal service clients and partners Currently, 63% of our workforce is trained and equipped with GenAI capability. To summarize our AI pivot and what it means for our business, we remain committed to investing in developing our AI intellectual properties as well as vertical and horizontal solutions. These investments are poised to deliver substantial results by fostering innovation, enhancing operational efficiency, and driving a competitive advantage. Let me now spend some time on our industry verticals. <clears throat> Q2 growth was led by the BSSI vertical, which registered a sequential growth of 4%. <clears throat> Banks focus on cost-cutting to <clears throat> restructuring, along with our strong relationship and execution track record, have benefited us in gaining market share. We have a robust large yield pipeline in this vertical with a few deals in the final stages. We are seeing more BSSI clients working towards getting data ready for AI. After a significant sequential growth of 7.9% in Q1 in the technology, media, and communications vertical, Q2 witnessed a further 1.9% sequential growth with a year-on-year -year growth of 12%. While cost optimization continues to remain the dominant theme for both hardware and software vendors, there has been a focus on, on infusing AI and GNI in products to enhance customer experience. This is expected to scale up further as the market matures. The manufacturing and resources vertical witnessed a steady growth of 0.7% on a sequential basis and 5.8% on year-on-year -year basis. We see continued traction in ERP while also gaining market share in vendor consolidation Leveraging our, leveraging our AI in everything theme. As mentioned earlier, we closed a deal of over US dollars 200 plus million in PCB in this vertical. <clears throat> our consumer business experienced sequential growth of 2.6%, aligning with the overall company performance. <clears throat> growth in Q2 was driven primarily by the TTH and retail sectors. We are employing AI to enhance customer engagement and as an entry strategy for some of our smaller verticals. Following a 7.9 drop in the Q1 revenue, the healthcare licenses and public sector vertical experienced a 5.9% sequential growth. In terms of geographies, America, which contributes 75% of our revenue, has grown by 7% on a year-on-year -year basis. <clears throat> Europe contributed 14.4%, and the rest of the world contributed 10.6% of our revenue. Let me now hand it over to Vipul. Okay, sorry. My apologies. Let me talk about the people front. On the people front, our headcount rose to over 84,000 at the end of the quarter as we added 2,500 plus employees during the quarter. For the quarter, our LTM attrition remains stable at 14.5% compared to the 14.4% last quarter. We onboarded 1,100 plus pressures this quarter. This quarter, we introduced an initiative called LTIM Rhythm, our vision of the future of workplace. LTIM Rhythm encapsulates our commitment to fostering a collaborative, flexible, and dynamic workplace environment that not only caters to the evolving needs of our clients, but also ensures the holistic development of our associates. This also helps us in implementing our strategy of AI for everyone, which we articulated earlier. I will now turn over the call to Vipul for the financial highlights. Thank you, Dithi, <coughs> and uh, good evening, everyone, uh, on the call. Let me take you through the financial highlights for the second quarter of FY25, starting with the revenue numbers. <clears throat> Our Q2 revenue stood at USD 1.13 billion, a growth of 2.8% sequentially and 4.7% on a year-on-year -year basis in dollar terms. The corresponding constant currency growth was 2.3% quarter-on-quarter 
and 4.4% year on year. Our EBIT margin expanded by 50 basis points to 15.5% as compared with 15% in the previous <coughs> quarter, majorly on account of absence of visa costs. Net forex gain for the quarter increased to USD 9 million compared to USD 1.6 million in the previous quarter. Leveraging our strong cash position alongside efficient investment management, we achieved an investment income of INR 212 crores this quarter. The effective tax rate for the quarter was 25.8% as compared to 25.6% in Q1. Tax margin for the quarter was 13.3% as compared to 12.4% previous quarter. Reported tax climbed to INR 1252 crores this quarter compared to INR 1135 crores in last quarter. Basic EPS was Rs. 42.3 for the quarter as compared to Rs. 38.3 in Q1 FY25. Built DSO increased to 60 days versus 55 days in Q1 FY25, which is still a reduction of 8 days versus Q2 of the prior year. The unbuilt DSO, however, reduced by 2 days. The total DSO was at 81 days compared to 78 days in the previous quarter. We continue to focus on our billing and collection efficiency to move towards our aspired target DSO of approximately 75 days. The operating cash flow uh, to PAT was 74.2% as against 109.9% in Q1. Free cash flow to PAT came in at 54.5% compared to 88.6% in Q1. <clears throat> the cash and investment balances to that USD 1.43 billion or Rs. 11,974 crore compared to the rupees 11,334 crore in Q1 FY25. Return on equity for the quarter was at 23.8%. As of September 30th, 2024, our cash flow hedges stood at USD 3907 million. Hedges on the balance sheet were USD 326 million. Our utilization excluding payments in the quarter was at 87.7% compared to 88.3% last quarter. This is in line with our continued investments for our growth momentum. The board of directors have recommended an interim dividend of INR 20, rupee, uh, 20 per equity share. We are pleased to announce that LTI Mine Tree has attained a rank of 13 across sectors and rank 5 in IT and communication sector in business world India's most sustainable company's top 50 listing for 2024. We are also looking to use our ESG capabilities to help our clients achieve their ESG goals in line with this. LTI Mindtree has launched a new comprehensive digital transformation and ESG platform, Smart Spaces 2.0, which can help with end-to-end -end ESG reporting across key factors while delivering predictive maintenance and repair inputs. These recognitions and actions serve as a testament to our proactive approach in integrating sustainable practices. I now hand it back to DC for the business outlook. Thank you, Vipul. <clears throat> Despite the challenging environment, our growth remains steady and in line with what we had indicated in the last quarter. We are cautiously optimistic about this momentum carrying forward into Q3. However, historically, Q3 experiences seasonal headwinds, as well as due to furloughs and fewer billing days, which could moderate this momentum to some extent. Additionally, wage hikes for all employees in Q3 are expected to put pressure on our margins. Nevertheless, our strategy shift towards AI has resulted in a robust buildup in our deal pipeline, with strong deal win, sustained deal traction in our key verticals, and significant hiring in Q2, including pressures. We are well positioned as we move into the latter half of the fiscal year. With that, let me now open the floor for questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while we poll for questions. The first question comes from the line of Sulak Govila from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, the first uh, question is around uh, the deal pipeline. So just wanted some color around that. Um, how has that grown and what's the nature of the deals that you have? Are you witnessing more short cycle deals than you did in the last quarter? And is that reflecting into better ACV trends? Subir, do you want to take that? Sure, easy. So I think, you know, uh, from a large deal momentum perspective, uh, you know, the pipeline continues to be strong. It has grown, uh, you know, uh, it's over $5 billion right now from a large deal perspective. Um, in terms of the demand trends that we're seeing, uh, we're seeing significant traction in the BFS uh, I vertical, as you can see in our growth numbers as well. And that vertical is also characterized by having a demand which is, uh, uh, you know, when I did I think short cycle is perhaps the wrong term. Uh, what we uh, are seeing is that we are actually, you know, doing uh, both a combination of deals as well as being opening uh, new logos as well as, you know, the new MSAs also that we mentioned last time in, in our call where we spoke about how we are being uh, chosen as a preferred supplier. So the, it's a combination of factors that is uh, now uh, resulting in, in a pipeline that has a combination of large deals as well as, uh, you know, demand from a, uh, as well as being on the right side of vendor consolidation, as well as demand from, uh, the, you know, slight increase in discretionary spend. Understood. Uh, secondly, I wanted to check um, what's leading to softness in the top six to ten client bucket. Um, the revenue in this bucket has gone down from $85 million a quarter to now $75, $76 million in the last two, three quarters. So is there any client-specific issue here that you're facing? I, I think, you know, <clears throat> it's fair to look at the, you know, we always look at the, the top 40 clients. And uh, if I look at, uh, and we also don't tend to look at on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis, we rather look at, at an overall yearly basis. And I think from that perspective, we are doing fairly well. I mean, if I look at my top 5, top 10, top 20, and top 40 client segments, uh, you know, there is definitely the concentration risk is uh, slightly reduced, but at the same time, if I look at the top 40 clients, they have still grown uh, uh, this quarter sequentially. I mean, in fact, all the buckets, top 5, top 10, top 20, top 40, there is a sequential growth, which is good for us. So overall, I think we are, the account mining is working, which is what our focus has been, and uh, we are happy about it. Understood. And, and the last question is on the margins for Ripple. Uh, uh, what should be the impact of wage hike that we should be baking in, in 3Q? And uh, uh, what would be the offsetting factors, some of the offsetting factors that can help you negate the impact? So uh, in terms of our wage hike impact, uh, you could take it uh, maybe approximately uh, 200 basis points. Uh, which will be partly offset by our continuing operational efficiency, uh, which we had started driving any which way, uh, you know, uh, two, three quarters back, and which are continuing. Uh, so some of those operational efficiency drivers will continue to kind of offset, uh, and the growth that we are also, uh, you know, looking for. So some of these things will partially offset the impact, but uh, may not be the full impact. Thanks for taking my question. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitin Padmamabhan yeah. with Investec. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, good evening. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, you spoke about furloughs. Uh, so, are furloughs uh, similar to what you have seen in the prior year? Is it better? Is it worse? Uh, that's the first one. Uh, the second is, uh, what are the areas where you continue to see uh, weakness uh, in the market from a vertical perspective? Uh, where you would want to see some improvement. Um, and finally, uh, uh, with regards to the large deal which you announced, uh, th that is a vendor consolidation with an existing client, if, if I'm right. And uh, if that is the case, then uh, in which vertical is this? Uh, and by when do you expect to start seeing ramp up here? Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so Nikhil, let me just try to answer uh, one by one. Uh, your question on uh, furloughs, I think uh, we all know, I mean, we, we realized that last year uh, the furloughs were a little more than what we had anticipated. 
So our uh, expectation this year is that the furloughs will be back to the regular levels that we used to have, so it is not going to be as high as it, it was uh, last year. So that's on the furloughs. If you ask me about uh, specific uh, areas, if you look at the growth that we have, in fact, all the five segments that we report our revenues on, uh, all the segments have uh, grown. But I would have liked my uh, travel and travel tech to do a bit a little better because there are certain uh, you know situations where some of our clients are uh, dependent on uh, specific uh, you know issues which. Uh, uh, we don't have much control, and that is one area where we are hoping that some improvement happens, uh, you know, as we go along. And from your last deal perspective, the deal that we talked about, and I think we called out in our uh, opening remarks as well, it is part of our manufacturing vertical, and it is a combination of uh, both, uh, you know, a renewal as well as some additional, uh, significant additional scope, almost you can say half hour, uh, and that's how we kind of scoped it through. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, that's how it is at $100 million plus deal. And, uh, this the transition has already started for this deal, so the deal will start ramping up, uh, in, the, in Q3. But in this, uh, geography, would that be? It's the US. Sure. Thank you so much and all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vibhor Singhal with Nuvama Equities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question and uh, congrats with me on our summit for this. Uh, uh, just uh, two questions from my side. Uh, firstly, on the BSSI vertical, very sharp recovery from um, what we saw, in, especially in the last two quarters of the last financial year. Uh, you also talked about some of the deals in BSSI, which are there in the pipeline and which we should be able to close very soon. So just to uh, uh, look at the outlook in the sector, do you expect the growth momentum in this vertical to continue, uh, especially after the interest rate cuts also coming in? Uh, uh, what are the specific areas in this BSHI where you are looking at in terms of higher tech spends, let's say uh, capital markets or insurance or which part of those businesses? Any color on uh, all those aspects we uh, in the input? And then I'll have a further question. Yeah, thanks, Bigot. So if I understood your question, let me just give you some color on... Uh, BSSI, uh, yeah. we are first of all very pleased with uh, the growth coming back in BSSI, uh, but specific to, uh, specifically about uh, the growth, uh, it is primarily led by uh, BFS, but it is, uh, the growth is fairly broad based across, uh, uh, you know, all the clients that we have. Uh, the growth is, uh, we, we have been, uh, you know, daily winning these deals in Two scenarios. One scenario is uh, wherever we are, we have been incumbent and there is a vendor consolidation. Uh, it has worked out favorably for us and also in a situation where, uh, we have not been present, but it's, uh, we are, it's a new logo for us. We have won that kind of, uh, deals as well. I must say that bulk of the wins that we have had in this, uh, uh, VFSI has been mostly, uh, cost takeout and efficiency oriented. Deals. Having said that, uh, you know, uh, our strength in uh, governance, regulatory and compliance uh, also helps in terms of driving some of the spends in this area. And uh, I can only say that, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> the cautiousness that we had in terms of discretionary spend, that has not significantly changed. So we still see, uh, you know, not much of discretionary spends coming back, but uh, as I articulated in whatever opportunities we are getting, there is a uh, there is a significant momentum that we have generated. Got it. So the decision spent those remain on hold. That we have not seen any change from the say the last quarter. Yeah, I don't think it's fair to say that there is any. I, I don't think there is much change in terms of discretionary spend. Uh, it, it is it is yet to come back. It's yet to come back. Got it, got it. That's really helpful. Uh, secondly, we see all the tech, uh, tech uh, high tech uh, vertical. Uh, of course, we had two very, uh, two quarters of very solid growth and this quarter was of the stock. So any color on that, given you uh, spoke a lot about uh, the Gemini applications that we are working through the, uh, uh, Kansas platform. So, uh, uh, how is the spend of this vertical? Are the users suspect the hyperscalers also going to drive, uh, the growth in this vertical? And given that, uh, uh, will our relationship with the top client that is also the high tech uh, vertical client 
will that also help us in this vertical not just immediately but let's say over the next three to four quarters well uh, we would the thing is uh, you know the tech uh, clients uh, uh, both the software as well as the hardware vendors i think they will always uh, look at the new technologies like ai gen ai very aggressively so uh, the focus still remains uh, significantly in terms of uh, cost take out uh, and you must have also read the uh, you know you must have also heard that quite a few of our uh you know quite a few tech clients uh, not necessarily just our clients they have been also doing some uh, layoffs but as far as our portfolio is concerned i don't think there is any uh, anything to be concerned about as of now because we still have a uh, a good growth, growth coming from you know that across the board in terms of uh, high tech clients you got it got it okay just now one last question if i could just squeeze in uh, in the last call that we have mentioned that in large part of our pipeline we have now pivoted towards uh, cost account deals so is that uh, pivot now or bearing a smooth as you mentioned lot of the bsi deals for cost account deals and do we intend to continue on that path or do you believe in maybe in the next couple of quarters we expect the distribution expense to come back and then there could be some uh, mix and match of the deal uh, pipeline there uh, look i think you know the most important pivot that we have done is uh, for us to be ready to support uh, you know you know transformation as well as efficiency deals i think that that's the biggest pivot that we have done in the last several quarters and uh, uh, you know at this point of time we have uh, closed quite a few cost take out deals and uh, you know that is kind of driving the growth uh, <clears throat> now when the discretionary will come back it's very difficult to say we will probably get an idea when the clients are going to their budget session which is not very far away but of course as we get to know we can always we can always share with you but it's a little too early to predict in terms of what is coming given the fact that you know it has been on a pause for quite some time and uh, you know i think what what is most important for us is that as i said we can play on both the sides we can play on the cost take out side we can play on the transformation side equally well i think that's the biggest pivot that we have gone through <laughs> Thank you for taking. Thank you for taking my questions and wish you all the best. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you wish to ask a question, please press star and one. The next question is from the line of Manik Taneja with Access Capital. Please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity. We just wanted to prod you with regards to the near-term outlook that you suggested. Uh, if I understood correctly, you said. the momentum that we seen in first half or the first couple of quarters there should be some moderation to that in the third quarter and uh, the second question was for vipul if you could help us with the quantum of wage hikes uh, that we have implemented and are they implemented for the full quarter or uh, unlike uh, one of our group companies is it a partial impact and the last one related to margins is if you could talk about your thought process about the medium term improvement in margins that we were uh, looking to achieve uh, in a couple of years let, let me take the the first question and then i'll request vipul to cover the other two uh, so manik uh, you know uh, as far as uh, you know the the h2 is concerned uh, we are cautiously optimistic about the momentum that uh, we have uh, generated we had told in q1 that the q1 momentum will continue to q2 that has happened uh, but at the same time uh, the, we are cautiously optimistic about this momentum carrying into uh, q3 because the historically q3 has uh, the seasonal headwinds as well as furloughs and fewer billing days uh, which could quarter, uh, which could moderate this momentum to some extent but at the same time you know the deals that we have closed in the last two quarters they have they have ramped up and they continue to uh, you know uh, they continue to uh, deliver growth so the momentum from that perspective will continue but the follow impact is still not known so uh, we have to just wait and watch people yeah so uh, on the other two questions that you asked i think uh, i mentioned uh, just now that uh, the impact of wage hike is going to be around 2% on our margin and it is a full quarter impact 
Uh, as far as the uh, you know the margin improvement, uh, your uh, operational efficiency initiatives that I spoke about, uh, largely is going to be driven uh, uh, you know the revenue growth and the pyramid correction that we are uh, working on. And as you would have uh, heard in the uh, you know uh, in the opening remarks from BC that uh, we have added uh, 2,500 plus uh, you know uh, headcount in this quarter, of which 1,100 plus are pressure. So we are working towards getting our utilization rate down, which we have talked about in the last quarter. At the same time, we are also focused on correcting the pyramid as we go along. And some of those operating efficiencies will keep on. Uh, if I can just uh, chip in with one more question. Uh, while not a very substantial increase, but over the course of recent quarters, we are once again beginning to see an increase in, in terms of our on site mix of headcount. Uh, do you think we continue to see this increase further, given the nature of demand, or, 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 or you you would assume to extract some more efficiencies from from a higher offshore mix? Let me request uh, Nathiket to take that. Nathiket. So this is actually not a, a strategic lever uh, that we look at from an improvement standpoint. It is actually a result of our business uh, in specific deals. So. We don't expect that to vary a lot. Yes, there was a marginal increase in the on-site ratio this quarter, but it's a quarterly fluctuation. I wouldn't read too much into it. Okay. And is there any timelines now for that 17 to 18 percent EBIT margin that we wanted to achieve in in a couple of years? So uh, again, as I uh, as I had mentioned in the last quarter as well. Uh, to get to that kind of a margin number which we are aspiring for, uh, the journey has gotten elongated mainly because of uh, you know the external environment as well, where unless and until the industry starts seeing double digit kind of growth again, it's uh, uh, it's going to be uh, you know difficult to kind of uh, move on that journey in a fast manner. So right now, I think the focus has to be more on maintaining the margin and uh, wait for the growth to come back. Sure. Thank you and all the best for the future. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rishi Junjunwala with IIFL Institutional Equities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, most of my questions have been answered. Just just one, uh, you know, basic understanding of the business as it stands now. Now, when LTI and Mindtree were two different companies, um, LTI used to have a, a revenue trajectory wherein second half used to be better than first half. Uh, in most of the years, in a normal spending environment. Um, is it fair to say that as a combined entity, now we are uh, very similar to how some of our larger cap years are, wherein first half typically in a normal environment would uh, uh, end up being better than second half? Well, I think, uh, you know, let me just uh, take a stab at it. Uh, I mean, whatever you do, whatever you say, but it also depends on, uh, you know, how client spends are and how the overall macro looks like. So uh, that's an experience that we had in the last fiscal. Uh, but, uh, you know, at this point of time, as we see, the, the momentum that we have had in uh, uh, the first half, uh, and uh, the the deals that we have closed, the uh, ramp up that has to happen, that momentum should continue, uh, barring the uncertainties and the seasonality that we have in uh, Q3. I think we should just leave it there and see how it plays out rather than trying to get ahead of ourselves. Right. Um, the other question is just in terms of the kind of yield we are generating on our uh, on our investments and cash. Uh, it seems to be north of almost 8%. So just wanted to understand the nature of investments we are doing and are there any kind of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, what, basically what's the nature where we are Let me request, let me request the pool to take that. Sure. Uh, so in terms of the uh, investments that we are doing, I think uh, most of the investments are in uh, mutual funds on the debt uh, side, either money market or, uh, you know, uh, GSEC and uh, corporate bond uh, portfolios in the mutual funds. I think it has been, uh, you know, uh, the better investment efficiency that we have been talking about it has been more proactively shifting the duration in line with the changing interest rate environment in the market, which has helped us generate or catch the, uh, you know, the interest rate move uh, properly as it has happened in the market. 
Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhishek Kumar from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening. Uh, thanks for taking my question. I have uh, two questions on furloughs uh, and let me ask them together. Uh, first, I just want to understand how to read furloughs. When you say, you know, furloughs this year would be a more normalized furloughs, does that mean that the uh, pressure on budgets are easing and therefore, because furloughs generally coincide with uh, budgeting cycles. So does that kind of uh, um, suggest that a budget next year could also be normal? Um, that's question number one. And question number two is some of your peers have said that furloughs this year would be similar to last year. Well, that could be because of difference in portfolio clients, etc. So when we say it is more normalized, uh, you know, which areas or which uh, verticals uh, we are seeing uh, furloughs normalizing and if, if there are any pockets where you see that furloughs could still be similar to last year. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, you know, it's it's very, it's a little too early to uh, predict the, about the budget cycle, etc. given the fact that, uh, you know, in, in the U.S., uh, elections are also, you know, on our way. Uh, so, as far as, uh, you know, budgets are concerned, budget for this year was already baked in and furloughs are uh, normal. And, uh, you know, what we had uh, last year, uh, again, furloughs are also reflective of the portfolio of clients that we had, and we really did not anticipate. So from that perspective, we are going to be definitely better compared to last year in terms of the furloughs that we better from a positive way from uh, our perspective. So that's, that's all I can say that, uh, you know, it is not, last year was a little uh, different, uh, but we'll get back to a normal furlough year as far as this year is concerned. But uh, difficult to talk about uh, budget till we, you know, with all the U.S. elections and all these things overhanging on us. What was, what, was there a second question? No. no, that was related to followers. Thank you, this is helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhishek Patel with Motilal Oswal. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so, uh, DC, um, on discretionary spends, uh, you know, our comments are, I think, slightly cautious as compared to uh, the payers who have reported so far. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, uh, like what's the divergence here? I mean, is it a portfolio mix or is it is it is it a more short term election led or furlough led approach that's leading us to uh, be slightly cautious? That's one. And the other bit is, uh, you know, of course, the growth this time has been uh, fairly broad based. Uh, um, so is it fair to assume that, uh, you know, whatever recovery um, that that's happening on the client side uh, is now finding more legs and, you know, it is becoming more widespread? And just if that is the case, uh, how comfortable are we on the headcount? Um, you know, what's the comfortable level of utilization that, that, that we think we should operate at? And, and in case growth really comes back in earnest, uh, um, how how would we sort of uh, look at the hiring strategy from here? Thank you. So, Abhishek, uh, let me you ask quite a few questions. Let me see if I can remember an answer. First is uh, when you talk about discretionary, uh, let me just take a step back and explain to you how we will normally classify the, the, the programs and the projects that we do for our clients. One is the efficiency, longer-term cost takeoffs. That's number one. Number two is when clients are investing in terms of, you know, building out new applications, in, you know, which is like, could be revenue-facing applications, uh, front-end applications, etc. Uh, that is, uh, you know, pure discretionary spend. And I would say there is a third category, which is clients also have, also have to deal with a lot of regulatory stuff, like governance, regulatory compliance stuff from time to time, which is not exactly a maintenance, but they need to still, you know, spend money to get those things out of their way. Now, I, I don't know, as far as we are concerned, uh, we try to identify our programs in these three categories, but for some, maybe the, you know, the regulatory and the discretionary could be the same thing. So we don't know how people classify, but as far as we are concerned, we definitely have been seeing a lot of traction in the cost checkout. 
Uh, we have been seeing a lot of uh, traction in terms of governance, regulatory compliance, wherever we work with our BSS clients, for example. And, uh, you know, but especially on the discussion when clients are trying to build new applications, I think it has been, it has been kind of an, on a pause for the last more than five, six quarters. And I think, uh, uh, we, we probably have to see how the, uh, once the, you know, US elections are over, probably there will be some initiative from the clients in terms of uh, looking at discretionary. But as of now, it is fair to say that for the, you know, except for, you know, AI related uh, investments which clients are doing, uh, where we are participating with them, I don't think there is any other area where clients are spending on discretionary. So that's the first part of your uh, question. <clears throat> I think, uh, what was the second question? Uh, so just uh, you know, uh, just just a bit around uh, hiring and and you know if, if the growth recovery is more broad based, uh, what yeah. what's the comfortable level of utilization and and how yeah, do you okay. to hire from here? Yeah. So so I think this quarter is a very good quarter for uh, for us because we are able to report a broad based growth and all the segments that we report on every segment has grown, which is a very good news and which is a very positive sign. Uh, but, uh, and, uh, of course, we will expect that the growth continue to be broad based. So from your perspective, from our perspective of utilization, we definitely, we have always called out that we are operating at an utilization, uh, which is probably slightly higher than what we would, what we would like. Our, uh, you know, target utilization range will be something around 85%. That would be ideal. And, uh, one of the reasons why we were operating for the last several quarters at a slightly higher utilization is also to ensure that we get the benefit and the you know, uh, benefit of the two organizations coming together, utilizing the bench from two organizations so that we kind of reduce the bench and make best use of it. So there was a specific design why we could operate at a higher utilization. But obviously, you know, as the growth comes back, we will be uh, we, we will aim to be at 85% utilization, and which will also kind of mean that there will be a headcount addition accordingly. We always try to add the headcount based on the business scenario. So I think you can do the math and you can see that there will be headcount addition from this point as we go along. Understood. That's very clear. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Chen with Doll Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh it would be great if you could give some color, both quantitative and qualitatively, on the deal signing during the quarter. Uh, we don't really talk in too much of detail, but still, today we want to give some uh, color. Yeah, I think we, I mean, we reported an order intake of $1.3 billion. I mentioned the overall large deal pipeline also of $5 billion. And, uh, you know, being on the right side of vendor consolidation deals, the deal momentum continues to be good uh, across, you know, so pipeline is also uh, strong and healthy across the board. Uh, and, you know, so I think in terms of the the, the verticals that we are winning deals, it's, you know, again, you can see it's a combination of uh, BFS as well as uh, manufacturing are, you know, leading the, the deal win cycle. But we're also seeing, you know, we have opportunities across all our verticals. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the large deal activity that we see. Thank you. And, and just uh, one bit, uh, on the consumer side of the business, if you could give any color uh, how we plan to revive growth prospect here. Again, the deal win does not feature this space, so anything more input here would be helpful. Yeah. Well, I think, I think on the consumer side, right. sorry, this is. No, DP, you already mentioned that there is some softness that we are seeing in, in a couple of our travel clients and our travel tech clients. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, when there is, uh, when I, I talked about the pipeline, the pipeline is, is across all verticals, including the consumer business. Uh, so we expect, uh, you know, as we enter the new calendar year, I think things will start to improve there. Sure, sure. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ayush with BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, so a couple of questions. So first is again on the consumer business. So just wanted to you know understand more that when we say that some of the clients are having some issues in the TTH vertical. 
So yeah. when are we expecting those client issues to get resolved, or, or are there any kind of a green shoots to be available that we are seeing and intra growth for from the next quarter or maybe like for the uh, next to next quarter? The second uh, question is for Ravi on the uh, uh, margin front. So if I see that our SGNA cost, you know, has been trending upwards, they are not that much, but yeah, definitely quarter and quarter basis. If we see 12.5 becomes 12.7 and then 1220 as a percentage of revenue. So what sort of comfort comfortable are we uh, range are we having that can subsidize the SGNA expense and are we like investing in towards hiring the salespeople for, you know, for the larger, uh, to chase the larger deals or some kind of investments are we doing there? So on the uh, first question that you asked, since you are uh, asking for something very specific, uh, let me tell you that uh, uh, the travel and travel tech clients that are part of our portfolio, they're also dependent on uh, specific uh, airline manufacturers, uh, which is uh, Boeing. In terms of airline, you know, in terms of delivery, I think that is something which is a well-known, uh, you know, fact that there have been severe issues, and I think they have been forced to scale back in terms of their spends, and which is impacting us. Now, I always say that uh, what happens to us is a reflection of not only just the industry, but the 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 section of clients we have as a part of our portfolio, uh, and that going through. Uh, hopefully, that should there should be some turnaround, but I don't think. It's easy to say at what point of time things will change. And, uh, you know, as far as uh, uh, the other thing within my consumer portfolio is there is uh, the real estate. We have a few real estate clients who are also part of the uh, consumer portfolio. And uh, ever since the interest rates have been uh, very high, there has been impact. But as the interest rates and the mortgage rates come down, I think hopefully there should be some, op- you know, there will be, uh, more opportunities in terms of spend with those clients. I think that will be my way of looking at uh, the consumer business. I'll request to Vipul to answer your other question. So I think your other question was on the SGNA and uh, cost uh, going higher in this quarter and whether uh, we are comfortable with this uh, uh, increase and it will come back. So the answer to that is that uh, we have had some seasonal, uh, you know, events, uh, sales events, etc., which uh, uh, you know, come about in this uh, quarter, uh, either in Q1 or Q2. Uh, and that's the reason for this increase in Q2 versus Q1. Uh, minus the sales events, if you look at the SDNA, then, uh, you know, it would have been probably a bit lower. So we are, uh, our operating efficiency steps include steps on controlling the SDNA cost as well. Great, thanks. Uh, just to follow up for, uh, for so they, if you can just bit explain because we are having you know a bit more exposure to the SAP. So what, what sort of you know uh, traction are we eyeing for the SAP because we have hired couple of you know uh, hiring uh, on the SAP front and what kind of what kind of demand are we seeing on that front? Sorry, I, I didn't quite catch that question. Could you just you repeat it again? So I just want to understand more about, you know, for from the SAP angle, like how are we eyeing, you know, the demand traction from the SAP and, and the hiring front, for uh, specifically for the SAP capabilities? Mm-hmm. Are you referring to SAP? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So, yeah, from an SAP perspective, you know, I mean, you, we know that there is a, there's an, has been a you know increase in demand because of the S4 HANA you know implementations that our clients are doing. Um, you know again we're working on several implementations right now. We are a top tier partner of SAP, so that uh, you know we, for us the ERP segment, which is our core, what we call core service line uh, offering, is is continuing to you know grow well, and and there's good traction in that market. Again, it's some of that is reflected in the growth and the deal-making that we are seeing in the manufacturing vertical specifically. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Girish Pai with Bob Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity. I have uh, three questions. Did I hear it right that the wage impact uh, will be about 300 basis points? That's question number one. Second, would the average resource cost for a Gen AI skills infused IT service organization be higher? And the third is uh, with regard to uh, mainframe modernization, especially in the BFS space, there's been a lot of talk of 
Jenny, I'm changing the picture there. Are you seeing anything changing on the ground on this particular aspect? So let me request Vipul to take the first question and then... Yeah. So on the clear. first question, I think uh, uh, what I had said was 200 basis points, not 300. So uh, I think that's a simple answer. And uh, when it comes to the Gen AI skill set, uh, see, it will be across the spectrum. So uh, if you talk about uh, uh, key talent which can build algorithms, platforms, and models, that talent, yes, would be a... Uh, expensive talent because it's a very niche and uh, uh, very uh, in-demand capability. Uh, but if you look at a large part of our talent pool, uh, that will need uh, knowledge of using Gen AI in improving their significant productivity. And that's where I think we are focusing on building that talent ground up, cross-skilling and upskilling all of our talent to be able to leverage Gen AI capabilities. Of course, there are some additional skill sets that we would require as well in around data tagging, around content moderation, and a lot of these skills that are needed in order to fine tune and uh, train the models. That's a very different skill set than what we traditionally had. And it will also come at a very different price point and a different background as well. So you need to look at it. It's not a one thing uh, that will define, but there will be a continuum of those skill sets with the journey. And the other part of mainframe modernization, the, uh, this you already referred to one deal in his prepared remark, which included in BSSI segment, which had a significant mainframe modernization component in it. And we are seeing uh, a good traction around mainframe modernization, especially driven by Gen AI tools, which can significantly cut the lead times and the uh, costs required to modernize some of those applications. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we take the last question from the line of Manik Taneja from Access Capital. Please go ahead. Yes. Thank you for the follow up, Niti. I actually wanted to pick your thoughts around, around the GCC activity that we are seeing, including with some of our larger hospitality clients recently. So it would be great to get your perspective as to how you think this plays out for our business over the medium term. Well, Manik, uh, GCCs are not something that is happening today. It has been uh, uh, there for uh, several years. And, uh, you know, we as a company have been uh, very clear that we have to work with the GCCs and coexist with the GCCs. Because if you look at the strategies of the GCCs, they will never, uh, they also have a very clear view in terms of uh, identifying areas where they work with partners. So we are... Uh, working with many of our clients who also have GCCs, working with them, with the U.S. teams, as well as uh, with the GCCs. So that will continue. So I don't think there is anything uh, specific that we need to worry about. We just need to continue what we have been doing. Great. Thank you and all the best for the future. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our question and answer session. On behalf of LTI Mindtree, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines.